Okay, everyone, I might just kick it off, start the webinar. I'm Lauren, I'm from TAS, I'm the event manager and secretariat for AWSN. And I'm just gonna take you through some housekeeping slides before we get to the webinar. So today we're gonna to talk about what to expect and how to apply for Australian government roles. We've got Nicole Shepherd from People Bank and Chris Miller from B4 Crisis. So just a couple of housekeeping things. When you, um, down the bottom of your screen, you can see the chat bar and that's where you can pop in any questions for the speakers. We'll be taking those throughout the presentation and also towards the end. We also have a code of, code of contact here at Australian Women Security Network. So our events represent opportunities to learn, share knowledge and network. At AWSN, we believe these events should represent a safe, enjoyable and inclusive environment for all people, irrespective of gender, race, ethnicity, sex, age, religion, disability, socioeconomic experience, shape, and so on. Unacceptable behavior will not be tolerated and we take our code of conduct very seriously. Anyone does have any issues, please feel free to contact us at board at awsn.org.au. Please also note that this web webinar is being recorded. We do have some upcoming webinars, which is very exciting. On the 14th of July, we have Nicole Stenson, who's going to talk about the fuss about surveillance. On the 21st of July, we have Scott McKean and Veronica Hall. We're talking about applying a risk-based security approach risk-based approach to security operations. Then in August, we have a um, speech by CyberCX, who is an AWSM Platinum sponsor. On the 20th of August, we have Louisa Snellner, who is talking about enterprise risk security. And then on Thursday, 17th September, we have Michael Redman, who is talking about governance in cybersecurity. We also have the AWSN Awards coming up. So this is a reminder, it's the last week to get in your nominations. So below is the link to get in your nominations. I'll also be putting that link on the chat um, so everyone can click on that and nominate if they'd like to. We would also like you guys to keep in touch. So we're at Twitter at AWSN underscore AU. We're also on LinkedIn. We have a private group and you can also follow the company there. We have a YouTube account and we also have on our website where the webinars will be um, uploaded afterwards. So you're able to pass them on to your colleagues if you'd like. We'd like you to confirm your AWSN membership. So please confirm this on a form that, so we can meet our new governments and privacy requirements. So if you go to awsn.org.au, then scroll down to our benefits AWSN membership to launch this Google form. We have had some members that have been experiencing some problems accessing this from their workplaces. So to ensure that you're able to access it, please use a personal advice and or a private email that is not connected with your IT security protocols. Okay, passing over to Chris, thank you. Fabulous. Thanks very much, Lauren. I'll just uh, try the tricky thing of sharing screen. <laughs> we did a test run and it worked, so let's hope it's working again today. Oh, yes, there we go. There's the youthful Nicole and the ageing Chris. <laughs> uh, some of you will be aware that we were involved with the um, resume webinar back on the 14th of May, and uh, I'll, I'll re refresh your memory on that. Mm, hang on, what happened there? It doesn't want to change slides. <laughs> okay. Ah, here we go. So to refresh your memory, um, there was that webinar that Nicole was involved in, and that was hosted by Kathleen Kennedy, another of AWSN's Cambridge chapter leads, and uh, featured two other AWSN members with Nicole. The idea for this webinar started as a result of that webinar that we perhaps needed to take people a few more steps forward. And uh, also for those, for those of you who are cadet members of AWSN, you'll be aware that uh, uh, Maddie, who, who is on the call today, hosted a, a session with Hay. Um, and uh, that webinar is also available on the recordings at AWSN's web pages, as well as on our YouTube channel. So all of this will bring you together into a very good position to apply for opportunities with the APS. Although some of the ideas that we'll be sharing today will be generic as well. So let's move on to where to go to find a job. Over to Nicole. 
Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, as it now is. Um, thanks for having me along today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present to all of you and hopefully provide some insights which might make you feel more confident or comfortable uh, when applying for roles in general. But in particular, as Chris said, the focus today is really around applying for those federal government roles and what to expect. Um, so once you've done your resume, um, as we did in the last webinar, um, what do you do next? Um, the, the absolute best place to go if you're specifically looking uh, for jobs in the APS uh, is to go to apsjobs.gov.au. Um, it's not just about uh, federal government, but there are also state government opportunities in there. And there are a variety of temporary registers, um, which is also uh, available for you to um, upload your details onto. And we can go into that in more detail uh, later if anyone has questions about what a temporary register is. Um, but then the usual suspects. So go to your job boards. Um, Indeed is a good aggregator of jobs, uh, Seek or Career One uh, for direct particular job boards. Uh, recruitment agencies uh, will also advertise uh, roles for the APS, um, whether they're contract, uh, permanent roles if uh, a recruitment agency is running a process for government, uh, or also those temporary registers. And it's also uh, a way to um, make an entry into APS as a what's called a non-ongoing, um, and that's a fixed term hire arrangement. And more often than not, those roles are also uh, facilitated by a, re a recruitment agency. Uh, and LinkedIn. Um, not that I've seen too many APS roles uh, specifically uh, on LinkedIn, but you may well find them there. Oh. Sorry, husband. <laughs> It was a question coming from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've we've um, got the resume. We've um, found a job. Now we need to apply. Yes, we do. So in terms of application for um, APS roles, and let's most of my conversation today will be around what to expect there. Um, so obviously, your resume is a good start. Um, some applications may require you to submit a full uh, and detailed resume. Some may just require uh, a high level information or an overview of um, the organisations that you've worked for and maybe the, the high level details of the role. And sometimes a resume is not actually required in a, um, a full resume is not required in a recruitment process because um, there may be an online form. Uh, so if they're using a um, a particular format for you to complete online, what they may do is ask you to extract pieces of your resume and actually upload that. And that way, it gives them an opportunity to view everyone's uh, resume details or job history um, in the same fashion. Uh, so starting with a resume, um, then the most likely um, requirement that you'll see from a, a federal government role will be a selection criteria response. Um, it's particularly important uh, for these roles that you follow what's called the STAR method. Um, so the STAR method requires you to provide information of the situation, uh, the tasks and actions that you completed and what was the result of that. So it's not unlike a behavioural interview. Um, they're looking for the same, uh, I guess, type of response, but in written format. Um, and they're also not looking necessarily for um, war and peace, um, maybe just uh, a couple of um, paragraphs. Uh, and they're not just looking at the example, but they're also looking at your written communication skill when you're putting this uh, information in. Um, other ways of applying or other types of application requirements could be an executive overview or a summary um, of your skills and experience. They may ask you to do that um, to a particular word count or page count. Um, and then there's also the one page pitch. So both of these uh, things are somewhat similar. So your summary might be a general overview uh, and the one page pitch is going to be more directed at what are the 
uh, key requirements for the position? Uh, what does the role typically involve or what are they looking for in terms of your skill and experience? And this is an opportunity for you to present yourself in the best possible light. Um, you may or may not um, use that one page pitch to follow uh, the criteria that they may have listed out for the role, uh, but certainly uh, you would want to be describing uh, experiences that you have that are relevant to the position. Um, it's also worth noting at this point that reasonable adjustments will be made uh, in an APS situation, particularly around uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, this doesn't just relate um, to uh, people perhaps with a disability, it may also be uh, affirmative um, measures uh, for uh, or identified positions for Indigenous uh, candidates as well. So really, I guess, um, with applying for uh, public service positions. Uh, they're going to try and be as inclusive as possible. Uh, they really are striving for diversity within uh, the organisation um, and they will make um, all possible adjustments to help people um, to apply uh, and also help them through the full recruitment process. Okay, so in terms of what to expect next, um, should you be successful with your application, um, and you may be one of um, hundreds, you may be one of tens uh, applying for particular roles, and if you're a graduate, you may well have experienced being one of thousands applying for roles. Um, and I guess the question is, well, how do they uh, assess who is most appropriate to go through to the next step of the recruitment process. So yes, they will look at your um, experience. They may also look at your qualifications if that's relevant. And particularly if you're a graduate, they may also look at things like uh, volunteering uh, or university projects or things like that. So make sure you do include those as well. Um, but the next phase will be um, a, a profiling phase. Um, it may come at the beginning, it may come at the end, it may come in the middle of the process, but I guarantee you, it'll be in there somewhere. So um, things that are quite um, typical are both the numerical and the verbal reasoning. Um, some of the verbal reasoning uh, profiling has dropped off in uh, recent times. Uh, and that in particular is to, uh, again, allow for more, more diversity and inclusion. Um, some of the verbal reasoning tests in the early days um, had a reliance on people um, for English as a, a first language. Uh, and of course, um, in a diverse environment, that's really no longer the case, but uh, it is something that still does pop up from time to time. Um, there may be other an uh, analytical or aptitude uh, type assessments. Um, they may be looking to see um, those analytical skills for a particular role or your aptitude, um, particularly if it's a more broad uh, and inclusive recruitment process uh, where they're casting the net wide. Um, they may wish to make assessments based on aptitude uh, rather than um, historical skill or experience. There may also be technical testing, and I've thrown this one in here, particularly because um, I'm talking to people um, on this seminar uh, or on this webinar who are more, most likely to be applying for technical type roles. Uh, now, when I say technical, it may not um, be just a coding test, um, but it may also be uh, for people with uh, skills and experience in project management or business analysis, they're going to want to understand um, the methodologies that you might use or the tools that you might have been exposed to. There's also the psychometric profile, um, probably the most feared uh, profile uh, for people um, going through a recruitment process. Um, please uh, don't be afraid of the psychometric profile and absolutely don't try and trick it. Um, there are built-in uh, lie detectors uh, into psychometric profiles um, and 
of course you will see um, the same question seems to be asked in multiple ways. Um, they, they're really just trying to assess who you are as a person, how you might approach uh, particular situations or how you feel about uh, certain aspects of um, a role that you might be about to perform in. Um, it is um, very, very important um, that you answer um, truthfully, uh, but also from the gut. So when you have that first gut reaction, uh, if there are, it's a multiple choice, um, when you see the answer that kind of resonates most with it, that's probably the one you're going to, uh, to go with. Um, if you labour over your response, um, that may also be noted depending on the profiling uh, tool that they're using. Uh, it may indicate that you've been um, uh, spending a lot of time on a particular question and that may come up as well. So approach it from the, as I said, approach from the gut. Uh, whatever that first thought is that wants to come out of your brain or out of your mouth is probably the one that you're going to go with. Um, but most of all, don't be afraid. Um, they are often um, used uh, to assess where you may need most um, support. Uh, development uh, or even mentoring uh, if they should bring you into their particular workforce. A lot of organisations these days are using them as a training needs analysis tool as well. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of um, insight into some of those um, prof profiling is the word that we use uh, in the industry but uh, you might think of them as tests. Yes, I had to smile there, Nicole, since my first degree was in organisational psychology and I actually did a lot of development of tests, psychometric tests. <laughs> it was interesting to hear your assessment. But indeed, it is very important. The majority of them have a lie score built in or at least they have a, a score that's built in for people who are trying to make themselves look good. <clears throat> right. As we used to call it a lie score. And indeed, if you're doing it online, a lot of the tests now will actually note how long you spend on a question. <clears throat> so they, they will be expecting you to answer quickly, as Nicole has wisely advised you to do. Uh, so uh, that's my suggestion. Read it, answer it. Uh, some of them you can skip over. So if it looks like it's something you don't quite want to answer, skip over it, go to the next question. You might be able to come back until you go to submit. That would be better than spending a long time tarrying on a particular question. And just to quickly go back, because I, I muted myself courtesy of the, the hubby clumping about, uh, I put in the two examples because, again, having been on many panels, they don't want to read War and Peace. And some of them, when they actually have word count where you paste it into or, or um, type it into their online system, it will cut you off. So if they say, we well, only want 250 words about this criteria, and you've got 251, it could be cutting off in an unfortunate place. So my advice there is, is what I do there is develop a Word document and literally count the words so that I can paste it into their system and not having it, cutting it off in strange places. So over to you again, Nicole. Okay, so you may have made it uh, through the profiling um, assessment phase. Um, as I said, that may come at the beginning, it may come at the end, it may be interspersed between other um, processes. But this next part is in relation to what you might expect uh, at interview or really part of the interview process. Um, because these days there are modern uh, techniques or tools that organisations may use uh, in this way. And you may never actually meet anybody face to face. So one of the um, more recent advancements, or I should say it's been around for a couple of years now, is what's called a one-way interview. Uh, and it's uh, done online. Um, and uh, what it will do is it will uh, ask you to respond to certain questions. Those questions will pop up on your screen and you'll be required to respond to them just like you might in an interview. Um, this tends to be... Um, um, something that might only last uh, eight to 10 minutes. So it's quite quick. And it's again, another way for people to um, just check if you've got one or two heads, although that 
might not meet the diversity and inclusion require. But anyway, we move on. Uh, but really just to uh, see how you might engage with them. Um, it's not the only technique that they'll use. Don't worry, there will be other um, opportunities for you. Um, but be aware that they will give you uh, a link for a practice run. I suggest that you not only use that practice run, um, but that you also might practice um, a couple of times ahead of actually sitting down to do that one way interview, because your answers are going to need to be sharp. You're not necessarily going to get those answers ahead of time to prepare. Um, sometimes they may give you a minute per question to read the question and then you've got some time to formulate your answer before it needs to be recorded. Uh, but more often than not, they're just nice, quick, uh, responses. Um, so some of the things that you might want to do, like Chris, is you might want to make sure that uh, your husband or the cat isn't in shot uh, or within the ear, ear shot uh, or the kids or whatever it might be um, and that you make sure that you can be seen on the screen uh, clearly and, and that you don't have any dirty clothes hanging around in the background maybe, you know, those sorts of things. Um, so one way video interviewing is a, a reasonably new technique. Um, what you might also receive is if you're actually going in for a face to face interview, uh, sometimes they're now providing you with a list of the questions ahead of going in. So they may give you uh, 15 or 20 minutes uh, waiting in the um, in the foyer uh, to read through those questions. Um, they might even ask you to, to make some notes on those questions and they might review those notes before you go in. Um, but it is, again, an opportunity for you to get your thoughts in order um, before you go into that uh, interview. And this is one way, um, and I think Chris might mention this a little bit later on, but it's one way where they're trying to help you to feel a little bit more comfortable um, in the situation uh, and take into account that people are nervous. Other techniques include uh, a speed dating style interview or interviews. Um, so you may get five minutes with one or um, two or three uh, different panel uh, members, um, usually on your own. Uh, and again, an opportunity for them to assess your communication style, uh, as well as your answer to um, technical questions or behavioral style questions. There is also uh, the typical face-to-face -face interview, or these days, many of them are actually being conducted uh, over video. So it would be important for you to also think about um, how to um, most appropriately uh, attend those uh, video interviews. Um, but a panel interview, the panel would typically uh, have three uh, panel members. Um, usually one of those members is going to be um, the supervisor that you might be reporting to and a couple of other supporting uh, people. You should also expect that there'll be a scribe in that interview. Now, some people turn up and all of a sudden there's, I've got to speak to four people. Um, well, yes, three is quite daunting, I'm sure, uh, but there's also typically someone in there scribing. So they'll be there taking notes. Um, I wouldn't normally see a scribe interjecting uh, into an interview, but they may ask you to repeat something so that they can make sure they capture that information for, for you and for the committee so that they can refer back to those notes. Um, and typically that's really what they're there to do. Um, I can see that Chris has uh, made some extra comments in there. Did you want to mention the panel interview information there, Chris? Oh, well, it's just that they can reasonably expect one woman, <clears throat> and particularly in security roles, that's why I had so much experience on panels, was it was actually quite hard to find a woman. So I found myself invited not only to panels within my own agency, but within other people's agencies. The sad truth was they didn't have any women working in the security space at the levels that I was involved in. So was unfortunate, but nonetheless, it, it gave me lots of experience. Uh, I suppose, and I'll come back to this in a moment, is not to be daunted by the face-to-face -face panel. If you've got through uh, making your application, making the shortlist to be interviewed, then the panel really wants you to succeed. So um, see them as your friends and, and not as daunting. 
and they will often ask you icebreaker questions that you might think, what the hell's this got to do with the job? It's to try and relieve your nervousness, to bring you into a discussion with them so that you can shine, so that you can show your best uh, because they are very mindful that a lot of people are nervous. And having been a panel chair on lots of interviews too, as well as a panel member, um, the panel's nervous. It's not just you. Um, they want to show their organisation, uh, they're part of the Australian public sector or other businesses that I've applied for. They want to show it their business in good, in good stead. Um, because although you may not be successful in, in this interview, you've got friends, um, there may be other opportunities and they'd like you to go away with a favourable impression so that you think this is a department or agency that I care to work for or another business that um, if another opportunity arises, I'd be only too happy to apply. So it, it's a two way street. And, and I think often people see it, uh, the, the applicant as an inquisition, but I, I've often pointed out that it's, it's two ways because you want to uh, go away with a favourable impression, say this is a department or agency or business that you'd like to be associated with, that, that you're on a similar page as the expression goes. So I'll hand back to you, Nicole, to talk about the in-tray tasks. Mm. Thanks, Chris. Um, it's really great to have your insights, uh, having been a panel member. Um, I think that should also add a lot of comfort to people who might be on this webinar today uh, to know that the panel are there to support you. Um, so other things that you might find during an interview process or indeed an assessment centre, um, maybe um, in-tray tasks. So this is really a job simulation um, situation. Um, there may be a group exercise or a group communication where you're required to engage with other members uh, who may be going through the same uh, process as you. Uh, they effectively are your competition. Uh, but when you turn up for a group exercise, you really have to work together with them, um, particularly if there's going to be a multiple selection um, or multiple positions. You may well be working with some of these people in the future. Um, the assessment centre situation uh, can vary quite greatly and there are many things that you may undertake during that uh, assessment centre. And it may be a combination of all of these things that I've mentioned over the last uh, couple of slides. So you may go in, it may be a, an in-tray exercise, there may be a group exercise, there may be a psychometric profiling at that point, uh, or a technical test um, at, uh, at the same um, assessment centre. Um, typically, if they're going to have multiple people in one place uh, at the same time, they're going to take as much advantage of having you all there um, as they possibly can. Um, but do be mindful um, that those people that you are um, working with, if you like, in those group exercises, um, you're all going to be very different. Um, don't feel if you're introverted and, and you're concerned about speaking in front of a large group, um, don't be too concerned. Again, there will be a number, number of assessors in the, um, in the situation uh, and they'll be taking into account the whole variety uh, of personality types uh, and the way that people are interacting with each other. Um, it's not always the loudest person who gets the job. I can see Chris nodding. Mm. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. And those um, examples that you've given there, Nicole, the in-tray group and uh, assessment centre, mm -hmm. tend to be sometimes at the lower levels and, and we're particularly trying to prepare people for what uh, in the APS we call four to six, which is level jobs. But as you move into more senior roles, these become much more important. And when Lauren from the Secretariat, Nicole and I were preparing for this uh, webinar today, we were discussing the work of one of my colleagues, Arthur Rabjohn in the UK, who does assessment centres for fire chiefs. Now you really wouldn't want to suddenly discover that this was a person that can't work with a group of people. <laughs> and that can't deal with tasks under pressure. <laughs> it's been pretty catastrophic <laughs> to appoint the wrong fire chief. So uh, in, in those, um, for, the, for the senior roles, uh, if you're interested in, in more than entry roles in the APS, 
you can expect those kind of high level tasks. They're getting more and more techno uh, and more and more clever. I started working on assessment centres for Coupole Queensland Police back in the mid 80s and they just got more and more fancy. Uh, and at the senior level, you would expect three interviews. So uh, the sort of senior level jobs I've gone for recently, you tend to have an interview with someone like Nicole, a recruiter, uh, just to make sure that what you put in the application might be true. <laughs> Uh, then then you, you often get a panel or some of these uh, processes that Nicole's outlined for you. And at the third level, you generally get interviewed by a very senior person, someone who will be your boss uh, to make sure that you're not a, that you will fit into the team uh, and that you have the um, sort of people skills. Often it's the soft skills at that level. So the first two levels, it's a bit more about your technical skills by the time you get to a third interview at the senior level, it's sort of your fit with the team, um, your people skills, your experience as a manager, those kind of things really come to the fore. And some years ago when, when my friend Christine Nixon was applying for the job of Chief Commissioner of Victorian Police, um, I actually had dinner with her with other friends the evening before she had the third interview for that job. and. Uh, she was a bit downcast about it because she'd applied for a number of senior roles in, in, um, in Australian policing and been unsuccessful until Vic Bowl. And that was with Steve Brax, the Premier. <clears throat> uh, and uh, I remember her saying, oh, well, I'll probably find another excuse to refuse me. And then, then of course, it was announced publicly that she'd been successful. And I remember emailing her and said, <laughs> they didn't find an excuse to refuse you this time. <laughs> you can only be as cheeky with your friends. I mean, uh, our history dates back to senior constables when she was working for uh, the chief commissioner in New South Wales and I was working for the commissioner in Queensland. So we had a lot to talk about over the years. But the point is that the more senior you go in, the more complex these processes become, the more inclusive of some of those lists that Nicole's mentioned, particularly the latter ones. So if you're pitching for a higher level role, you should expect that. It will be quite a complicated recruitment process and it will possibly involve up to three interviews. That is not uncommon. Mm, Thanks. No. And actually a presentation may also um, be part of the, the process. Mm. Head around mute once. <laughs> oh. There you are, you're back. <laughs> it's back to me. <laughs> I just made a few notes. Nicole did the, the lion share of this presentation, but I made a few notes, some of which I've already covered. So please, the panel is not your enemy. <laughs> they really want you to succeed. So even if you're nervous, remember they could be nervous. Again, in the preparation, I was talking about a panel at a very low level where we were recruiting an APS2 uh, and the problem for me was as the panel chair, I'd come into the APS at a, at a sort of middle manager level. I hadn't, hadn't sort of moved my way through the ranks. So I didn't actually know what was it really expected of an APS too. Um, so I, I hunted around and found a colleague at the four level who had come through the ranks and I put him on the panel because I wanted someone that had that experience so that we weren't expecting too much of the applicant. And so the panels are very carefully formed as, as a panel chair. I just didn't have, you know, the first person that came to my mind. I actually spent quite a bit of time, depending on the nature of the position, trying to make sure that the panel was a good match for the applicants, that we were making reasonable assessments of the applicants at the correct level, because although I have this background in industrial and organisational psychology, um, Often I was trying to recruit people that came into the APS at a lower level than I did. So I wanted to make sure that my expectations were reasonable, both in interview and capacity to deliver the services that we were looking for. And remember when you're at a panel interview, you made the shortlist. <laughs> um, again, we were talking about one interview where there were uh, 426 applicants. <coughs> Uh, and I think we only interviewed six people. Mm. So you're, you're on the short list. And again, often if there's only one role, and now this is a little trick I'll give you, 
When you're looking for APS jobs, look for ones that say several positions or something like that, or a short list, um, a merit list will be um, developed as a result of this process, because that gives you a really good chance of getting a job. Um, because that means that there's more than one job. Um, and if there's a merit list, you'll probably be considered on that merit list for about 12 months after all this work that you've gone to. So you might get a, a, a phone call you know, or an email some months later saying, hello there, Nicole, we've got an opportunity for you. So look for the positions that are advertised with several positions or merit list or that kind of thing mentioned because that really increases your chances greatly. Um, I've often said to people who've been a bit nervous about being interviewed, um, approach it that they'd be lucky to have you. And indeed they would, but they make it quite confident, so not brash. Um, and that just helps you kind of relax that, you know, I, I have the right stuff or they wouldn't be interviewing me. Panels, they generally take two, uh, one, two or three days of extremely busy people's time. Uh, so they would not be interviewing you unless they thought from the evidence that they'd had so far that you could be a match for them. So be quietly confident that that um, uh, that they're very interested in the skills that you might bring to the role. Uh, also, for instance, I remember one really difficult interview, set of interviews where we had six brilliant people. It came down to two extremely brilliant people. And it was a very odd job because it was executive officer, which is it was at the sixth level for a um, first assistant secretary. So a very senior person. But the problem was this, this FAS was not a permanent public servant. So he couldn't chair the panel for the person who was going to work for him very closely. <laughs> Unusual. <laughs> it was a bit strange. <laughs> And we were both psychologists, uh, his name's Grant, um, both psychologists. And uh, we were both sort of joking, you know, who's interviewing who here? But anyway, eventually the panel uh, formed and we had two outstanding applicants. And as Grant said, there's a cigarette paper between these two. <laughs> so of course that was a terrible problem for writing up the uh, report. We didn't have a scribe. I was writing the report as the panel chair. And he said, I don't know how you're going to write this report, huh? <laughs> it's both so good. And in the end, the only thing that we could separate these two absolutely brilliant applicants was subject matter experience because it was in crime prevention and policing. One of them had that background, the other one had a different background. So it was a real struggle to separate them. And I remember um, ringing up the unsuccessful applicant and saying, another Chris actually, saying, oh, it's such a shame that we couldn't have you both <laughs> because you were both so good. And uh, hopefully if there's another role, we'll certainly keep you on the, the merit list uh, for fu future consideration because we would have loved to have you on the team, but we only had the money for one job. Uh, so that again, just illustrates how the panel's on your side. <laughs> You're not your enemy. <laughs> and yet sometimes, uh, particularly uh, people at a junior level sort of come in at the four, four to six level, very nervous and, and thinking we're the enemy, we're not. Now, another thing is to keep your answers brief. Um, and if it's possible to give different, so if you're doing the two examples type thing, which a lot of selection criteria are asked for, try and give a different example or a different spin on it, perhaps, if you don't have a different example, because at the four to six level, we wouldn't expect you to have a lot of experience, but you might have done some volunteer work. Um, you know, you might have been involved in a university activity. Um, you might have done an internship uh, with a, a possible employer. Um, who knows what you might have done that would be useful uh, that, that you could use as an example of your experience uh, to highlight to the panel that, that although you've been studying, um, you, you've also had some real world experience which is always very well received. Uh, yeah, so back to the, try and keep your answers short, because often when people are nervous, they just rabbit on and on. So just 
you know, a few sentences, maybe a paragraph equivalent, and then shut up and let the panel ask you if, if they need points of clarification. One of the best interviews I ever saw for an APS 6 job was a woman that, as we say, skyrocketed ahead. The last time I heard from her, she was a fast. <laughs> and I remember interviewing her to enter the public service at the APS 6 level. And she did her interview in 20 minutes and it was absolutely brilliant. Now, she was a lawyer, so she was obviously trained to, you know, get to the point. But um, Bronwyn was just brilliant at interview. I've never seen a better interview than Bronwyn. She answered all the questions very well and just blew the panel away. I mean, yeah. Bad luck for the other applicants that day because she was just superb and we were started on the team. And unfortunately, we didn't keep her very long um, because as one of my bosses wisely pointed out some years ago, when you've got good people, other people want them. <laughs> and it was onwards and upwards for her and I was always cheering her on. And I was so pleased to be the panel chair that brought her into the public service because she has turned out to be a brilliant asset and we've been so lucky to have her. Um, oh, yes. And this, this one, last point, um, it's a good idea to know something about the business. So if you're applying for a job for, say, Department of Social Services, where I used to work for a while, they've got a very detailed website, have a bit of a surf around, look at the org chart, um, look at the annual report or um, that sort of thing. Just, or even look at, you know, the about page on the home page so that you at least got some idea of the scale and scope of the business. Um, so it looks like you're trying to join the team because you do have some understanding of, of the part of the APS, because the Australian Public Service is very big, um, that, that you're applying to join and that will be well regarded from the panel that'll look like that you've, you've taken the time to do some research um, and that you really do want to be part of the team at that part of the APS. Anything else you'd like to add, Nicole? No, I think that's really great advice. Um, and I think the social services uh, piece is a good example. Um, if you're applying for a role with them and you have a passion for that area, um, then share that passion in your responses uh, and show that you have knowledge of even just some of the projects that they might be working on. Um, it's pretty easy to uh, run a little Google search and, and see what projects or what relevance um, those uh, pieces of work might have uh, for the Australian public and how you might be serving them. So make sure you do, do the the research and include that in your response, um, both at interview and potentially in selection criteria. Yes, and that definitely applies for non-public service jobs too, is to make sure you know something about the business. Everybody's website now is quite thorough in terms of telling you things. So don't be shy, do some yeah. research. Okay. I went for a third interview with one job um, uh, uh, with a private company and I checked out their share price before I went into the interview. Mm. You know, any little detail because it just shows that you were genuinely interested in trying to work with them. Okay, so my considerations. I'll just do a little bit and then back to you, Nicole. Referees. <clears throat> now, some uh, online systems will require you to provide referee details before you can actually submit your application. You won't be surprised that I've been the referee for an awful lot of people. So I've been on panels as a member, as a chair, and I've been a referee, goodness knows how many hundred times I've done that. Usually the APS will require two. That's generally the case, but it can vary. Sometimes for a lesser role, they might accept one. And sometimes for a more senior role, they might accept, want referees in all sorts of strange ways. So for instance, I was involved in the panel uh, for an SES position at one stage and I actually asked the um, interviewees to provide a referee from someone they supervised. Now that actually came as a horrendous shock to some of them. <laughs> but you see, that was a very good question because it pointed out that if you'd been a good manager, you could list a whole string of people who'd be happy to be <laughs> an underling referee 
because you've been a good manager and, and they'd be happy to say something nice about you. <laughs> but it was interesting, one of the people that had otherwise done very well in that interview, up until that question, started to look very stumbling. And I thought, uh-oh, there's more to know here. Uh, so, again, it's senior roles. But at junior roles, you generally be expected to provide two. Sometimes you input that online with your application. Now, please, having been a referee, make sure they're willing to be a referee. Don't presume it. Have the good manners to phone them up, email them. And if they're kind enough to say yes, then make sure you send them some stuff. So send them your resume, your latest resume, because you may not have been working with them for some time. They might need to know what latest things you've been up to. If you've got responses to the selection criteria, because they will be asked as a referee to respond to the selection criteria in the context of your work experience with them. So it's handy because they might need to have their memory refreshed that, you know, you did this project or that project and they go, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Oh, Nicole was really good at that. Yeah, yeah. And they'll see it in your selection criteria and they'll be able to reflect that when they're, they're giving their comments to the panel chair or the scribe. Please remember these are very busy people and they are doing you a favour. And don't surprise them. I actually had someone do that to me a couple of times. I got a ring, ring. Oh, you're a referee for X. And I went, huh? What? Now, luckily for them, I kind of made up a bit of a story, but I didn't know they were applying for a job. I had no idea what job it was. So it was actually a bit stumbling on my part, responding on their part because I, I didn't know what the hell was going on. Now, I probably faked it enough because they both got the job. But don't, don't dump surprises on your referees. Don't have them with a cold call from a panel member or the chair or the, or the scribe, or you'll find them much less likely to help you out in the future. Back to you, Nicole. All right. I'm mindful that... Um we need to get to questions. So I'll go quickly through, um, I guess, the, the housekeeping, if you like, at the back end of a selection process. Um, a number of um, public servant uh, recruitment processes may be done either internally by the APS team, uh, or they may in fact outsource the process uh, to an external provider. Um, if it's an external provider, you could reasonably expect uh, that the timeframes might be uh, quicker uh, because they're a dedicated team working exclusively on that particular project. Um, but do anticipate that it, it may be um, eight or even 12 weeks for a process to run its course, depending on the number of applicants. Um, if it's uh, direct with APS, you may also reasonably expect that it could go quickly, again, depending on the applicants, but it could take longer and it may take um, potentially um, three, four, even five um, months to complete a process, um, depending on the requirements. Um, but don't lose don't lose hope, I guess. Um, and as Chris said, um, where an organisation is recruiting for multiple positions, um, or indeed, you know, they may only be recruiting for one role, um, but what will be created at the end of the recruitment process is what's called a merit list. Um, and those merit lists can be drawn down upon for a 12 month period. So while you might not be successful in the one particular role or the couple of roles that they had available at the uh, onset, um, over that 12 month period, they may release other positions at that same level uh, and similar type roles where they may in fact reach out to you uh, as they work their way down through the merit list. So I guess what you might also consider is that you might not be looking for a, a job tomorrow. Um, you might not be looking for a new job in eight weeks, but if you're thinking of uh, a change over the next maybe three or six months time, you may well be well served by applying for some roles um, that you might not be interested in straight away, but in fact, you might get picked up on, on rounds into the future. And you're always welcome to say thank you, but no thank you, I'm not available at this time if you are selected, but ask to be remain, remain on the merit list. So that's okay too. Um, 
um, security clearance application and process. Um, do be mindful again that these can take some time and some of the uh, APS um, may not be able to engage you again tomorrow. Um, you may have uh, indeed a six month wait uh, if it's an NV1 clearance uh, requirement and they can't accept you uh, on site until that clearance has come through. And if it's an NV2, um, it may be as much as 12 months before you can actually um, start in the, in the role. So again, be mindful that these things take time. Um, but if this is something that you're really looking um, looking towards uh, for your future, um, then hang in there. Um, but uh, yes, you may well find that uh, you need to wait for a security clearance before you can commence uh, or a lower level clearance where you can commence. They may have uh, meaningful work for you to do um, or indeed some training or coaching, uh, upskilling during the period of time whilst you then wait um, for your higher level clearance to come in and you can actually get your hands really dirty into the role that you uh, are looking forward to. Um, and again, uh, commencement timeframes, uh, the same there. Uh, please don't expect if you apply for a public service uh, permanent role one day that you could be sitting in the role four weeks later. It's really, that would really be quite unrealistic. Um, Onboarding, again, just letting you know that there are often lots of hoops to jump through, even though you've been the successful applicant before you could actually be onboarded. So keep those things in mind. But um, again, I'm mindful of the time, so I think we'll leave it there. Okay, fabulous. So uh, we've got some helpful links that Carl's provided for you and a couple of opportunities uh, that we'll, we're sharing that uh, might um, appeal. Uh, the APS 4, 5 and 6, which is, as I say, graduate level. And if you're interested in some um, private sector work, our platinum sponsors, uh, Cyber CX, are also offering some opportunities for graduates and in a number of role areas. And keep your eyes on LinkedIn. Um, we have many jobs advertised there. so. Don't miss out on an opportunity that might match you. Thank you so much, Chris and Nicole. That was great. Um, just to all the audience now, does any, anyone have any questions that I'd like to ask our guests today? No, well, I might just jump in first and ask the questions that I jotted down during the presentation where people might be typing. You mentioned at the end timeframes, not to expect it to happen within four weeks. What would you consider an average time frame then from when you apply to a job to when, job to when you could be given an offer? Mm. With public service positions, I think you could reasonably expect uh, eight to 12 weeks would probably be... Um, a reasonable expectation, but it may well be a little longer than that. What are your thoughts, Chris? Especially if there's security clearances involved. <laughs> even even uh, uh, many of the jobs that I do as a contractor, they have to have a police clearance from you, which varies between five and 10 days. That's just to give you a security pass when you're building. Okay, fabulous. And we've just got one question through. As a graduate, is there any specific experiences volunteering, for example, or qualifications that could help me stand out to APS recruiters? Nicole? Yeah, sure, I'm happy to answer that. Um, I wouldn't say anything in particular. Um, if you have volunteering experience, then draw on the relevancy to that when you're applying. So if you're volunteering um, for the Red Cross uh, and you're coordinating uh, packs to go out to families, then you would draw on your experience of coordinating others, communication, uh, taking into consideration, uh, you know, people across a variety of socioeconomic backgrounds. So you can look to see what those links are and apply them. Um, if you're looking to use your university uh, or internship projects, um, again, look at the relevance of those for the job that you're applying for. Yeah. Okay, great. Absolutely. And bear in mind that at, at times, AWSN has been able to connect some of our cadet or entry level members with those sort of opportunities in volunteering. Um, for, for some time, we, we had a, a um, 
a chief technology officer with a major not-for-profit where we had a couple of the cadet um, AWSM members working with her, which was wonderful for her because she got some projects that she'd been unable to progress, progressed. And they got some real work experience, referee from a senior person, which yes. is gold when you're starting out at an entry level to have that, that wonderful reference from someone at a much higher level than you generally be expected to have at an entry level role. Great, and just another one for yourself, Nicole. Um, are there any state government application process, uh, sorry, are the state ap government application process any different from APS in terms of expectations in interview? No, no, they're not. You can reasonably expect most of these steps uh, or a series of these steps at state government. And you can also consider them in private enterprise as well. Uh, I guess today we were just really focusing on some of those examples where um, they're most relevant to APS. So, uh, but you could reasonably expect any of these things to occur uh, these days. Yes, and, and just to reinforce that, I've worked for Queensland, New South Wales, ACT and the Commonwealth. And yeah, slight variations on theme, but the basics are still the same. Yeah. Okay, and then Anna just has a question um, for us, if you'd like to go ahead, Anna. I don't think we can hear you. No, it might be best if you just want to maybe type it in um, the question area to come through, because I think there might be a bit of an audio problem um, with that one. Um, you were mentioning, Chris, that you had a colleague that was a bit disheartened that had um, gone through the application process for a few different jobs that hadn't gotten near anywhere. What advice would you give people that also feel like they're in a similar position and um, applying for jobs, very interested, but just not getting to the next step? Keep trying, it's a numbers game. And, and use your experience. So for example, if you're unsuccessful and there's a contact officer, um, contact the contact officer and ask them, you know, is, is there something I could have done differently? Um, what were you looking for? Um, the contact officer's obliged to provide you with some sort of rationale. In some places, they're actually obliged to provide you with written feedback, which could be your written assessment that went up through the panel. Um, and that could be quite helpful for you for future interviews where they might say, you know, uh, looked impressive, written, but uh, seemed to lack verbal, demonstrated verbal skills at the interview or something like that. Um, it could be any number of things. Uh, I'm just sort of grasping at straws of the reasons why people might not be quite so successful. Um, so. Uh, do contact the contact officer if you're unsuccessful and leverage their advice for future opportunities, but keep trying. It is a numbers game. And as I said, look for the jobs that have got several positions or a merit list mentioned because they increase, increase your odds. Okay, great. Um, Anna, do you want to have another go at possibly asking your question? I know you're trying to work the mute and unmute, see if that's successful. Oh, I don't think so. Does anyone else have any other questions for Chris or Nicole today? Okay, not a problem. We might leave it there, guys. Thank you both very much for your time. It's been a really informative webinar, I've found. Great. Thank you all for investing some time today, and we hope, uh, we hope to see you in the APS sometime soon, if that's what you're looking to do. Fabulous. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank you. Bye.